Hello and welcome back to the Motocross Vault. My name is Tony Blazer, and what this video is going to cover is a look back at one of the most iconic ATVs of the 1980s, Suzuki's original 1985 Quad Racer 250. This is a machine I actually have never owned, but uh, I have ridden it several times. I love ATVs. I'm not one of those moto guys that is really negative towards quads. Uh, I never had much love for three-wheelers. I've crashed plenty of them, but quads I actually have had several of them. I love them. They're fun. Uh, I've had uh, the 1987 250R 4-tracks, one of the greatest quads probably ever built. I've had several sport quads, including uh, like a 400EX and the Quad Sport 400 uh, in the early 2000s. had two of those. Really, really love those bikes or quads. They are, they're a lot of fun. This original LT250R was not the greatest performer in terms of raw speed. The stock motor was very choked off. It's actually based on like a dual sport engine. It's not anything close to what the RMs are putting out at the time. They really are kind of choked down, and they're made for overall use. They're more like a RMX or something than an RM. But uh, that being said, the real advantage of this machine was its stability. The, the adding the additional wheel made a huge difference. If you've ever ridden a three-wheeler, they can be a lot of fun, but they also can be very treacherous. And the quad, uh, while it can still be treacherous like any off-road machine, it's way more stable and a lot easier to ride. I remember riding one of these back in the 80s. At the time, I had a Yamaha Blaster, and I was actually surprised at how it didn't feel a whole lot faster than my Blaster in stock condition. It was not, like I said, a rocket by any means, uh, but they were a lot of fun. And I think once you open them up a little bit, they were pretty potent uh, off-road racers in their own right at the time. Now, if you like this sort of thing, make sure you check out some of the other videos I've done. I've had all kinds of retrospectives on my channel from motocross, off-road, and ATVs, a little bit of everything if you're an off-road enthusiast like myself. If you'd like to support what I do here, I have Motocross Vault merch available in my Teespring store. I have dozens of different designs based on all kinds of motocross and off-road and even ATV designs. And I'm happy to do something customized for you. I can put your name and number on the back of the shirt, uh, put your bike in the back of a truck or something cool like that. I've done that for many people. If you'd like to see something I can do for you, just hit me up uh, at themotocrossvault at gmail.com. And I'm happy to see if I can come up with something special for you. Or you can DM me on uh, Instagram as well, which is at Tony Blazer. So here, without further ado, as I look back at Suzuki's 1985 LT250R Quad Racer. The 1980s were a great time to be a high-performance ATV enthusiast. Starting in 1981, with the introduction of Honda's first ATC 250R, the ATV world exploded with high-performance offerings designed to cater to customers looking to do more than just putter through the back 40. Honda's ATC 250R, Yamaha's Tri-Z250, and Kawasaki's KXT250 Takati delivered exhilarating performance to those with the skill to harness their elevated potential. Unfortunately, however, as the speeds and popularity of these three-wheeled ATVs increased, so did the scrutiny placed on them by consumer advocacy groups. Many people outside, and some inside the industry, felt that the inherent instability of the three-wheeled platform made them unsuitable to be sold to consumers who were ill-prepared for their potentially treacherous nature. In 1983, Suzuki introduced their answer to this ATV issue in the form of the LT125 Quad Runner. Powered by a 124cc four-stroke single, this mildly tuned four-wheeler added a second wheel to the front of the chassis and changed the ATV world moving forward. With high-flotation balloon tires as its only suspension and a very modest power output, the original Quad Runner was no threat to machines like Honda's all-new ATC 200X in performance, but its inherently better stability made it an attractive alternative to the entry-level three-wheelers being offered by Honda, Kawasaki, and Yamaha at the time. Despite its limited performance potential, consumers and magazine editors alike were immediately taken with the Quad Runner's improved handling and stability. The little quad proved a big hit, and in 1984, Suzuki added the Quad Runner 50 and 185 to the lineup. Like the LT125, the new 50 and 185 were aimed at the entry-level market, but Suzuki had bigger plans in store for 1985. The 1985 season was a huge one for ATV enthusiasts, with the introduction of Honda's all-new liquid-cooled ATC 250R and the big-bore four-stroke ATC 350X. Yamaha finally entered the high-performance ATV game as well in 1985 with the unveiling of their all-new Tri-Z 250. All three of these machines were praised for their excellent performance but all three also suffered from the inherent limitations of the three-wheeled platform. High speeds and uneven terrain presented challenges to three-wheeled pilots that even the most talented and experienced riders could often find difficult to navigate safely. The new breed of high-performance three-wheelers were faster and had better handling than ever before, but they still required a tremendous amount of skill to operate safely. Just as the high-performance ATV market was heating up in 1985, Suzuki was once again prepared to reshape its landscape 
with the introduction of another revolutionary all-new machine, the LT250R Quad Racer. Targeted at the enthusiast market, the Quad Racer was a direct competitor to the 250R Honda, Yamaha Tri-Z, and Kawasaki's Takati. Like its three-wheeled competitors, the new Quad Racer employed a liquid-cooled two-stroke single for power with a five-speed manual gearbox, primary kick-starting, and a manual clutch. While the motor looked a bit like an RM engine of the time with its works-like silver paint scheme, the engine actually shared most of its DNA with Suzuki's Japanese market RH250 dual sport motorcycle. That meant significantly less horsepower than the motocross versions, but more versatility with its wider ratio gearbox and a counterbalancer to reduce vibration. The new motor displaced 249 cc's and employed Suzuki's semi case read power read intake made it to a 32 mm flat slide McCuny mixer and Suzuki's pointless electronic ignition. A thumb throttle handled fuel delivery duties, leaving the Takati as the only high-performance ATV in the class to offer a motorcycle-like twist throttle as standard equipment. The top end of the motor lacked any sort of variable exhaust mechanism, and it was low-tech aside from its liquid cooling. Like the other ATVs in its class, its mission as a do-it-all machine dictated the use of a large spark-arrested muffler and a well-sealed but choked-off air intake system. This kept the machine quiet and allowed it to handle water crossings with little issue, but it did hinder its maximum power output significantly. On the chassis front, the quad racer broke new ground by replacing the single wheel and forks found on the competition with a set of dual wheels connected to a frame using a fully independent set of A-arms. Dual shocks handled the damping with 7.9 inches of travel available and spring preload is its only external adjustment. In the rear, the new quad racer used a version of Suzuki's full floater single shock rear suspension to provide 7.9 inches of travel with four-way rebound as its only external damping adjustment. A large box section alloy swing arm provided strength and kept the weight down while powerful hydraulic triple disc brakes allowed the quad racer to dive to the inside line with ease. Despite its additional wheel, the new quad racer's weight was remarkably low, with the machine clocking in at a very svelte 293 pounds. This was less than Yamaha's Tri-Z 250 weight in 1985, and only 2 pounds more than the class-leading Honda 250R. At 50.8 inches, the quad racer's wheelbase was slightly shorter than the Yamaha and Honda trikes, but 0.3 inches longer than the Kawasaki. In a nod to stability and steering precision, the front wheels of the quad racer were spaced out as far as possible with the LT250R sitting slightly wider at the front than in the rear. Previous Suzuki quads had placed the gas tank below the seat to keep the center of gravity as low as possible, but the addition of the full floater rear suspension necessitated a repositioning of the fuel tank to a more traditional location. Like the other ATVs in its class, the quad racer featured tall and narrow tires at the front and low profile balloon tires in the rear. On the trail, the all new quad racer was a revelation in handling performance. The addition of the second front wheel gave the quad racer a tremendous advantage in stability and steering precision that was impossible to ignore. Even hardcore ATC enthusiasts were immediately impressed with the stability and precision of the Suzuki platform. Off cambers and uneven terrain that were treacherous to navigate on a three-wheeled ATV were completely no drama affairs on the quad racer. Off jumps, the Suzuki was a neutral flyer and it was far more forgiving if you happened to get out of shape when landing. In the turns, it essentially went where it was pointed which was a significant improvement over the often arcane handling manners of the trikes. At speed, it was exponentially more stable than its competition and required far less body English to maintain control. In terms of handling, the only real disadvantage was the weight of the front wheel, which made it more difficult to loft the front end over obstacles. Wheelies with the quad racer were certainly possible, but it took a stronger tug at the bars and more throttle to get the front end off the ground. Interestingly, this improved stability turned out to be the only real performance advantage the quad racer had over its ATV competition in 1985. The new motor was smooth and easy to ride, but not particularly powerful. Low end torque was decent, and the motor pulled well through the mid-range, but there was very little excitement once the RPMs climbed. The choked off intake and exhaust and small 32mm carburetor produced a quiet, pleasant, and mellow spread of power, but that fun was not particularly exhilarating. The counterbalancer quelled most of the motor's vibration, and the Suzuki was far more pleasant to be on than the balancerless Yamaha and Kawasaki on a long ride. The clutch offered a light pull, but several riders commented that the Suzuki's transmission was notchy and stubborn at times. Some riders also mentioned a disconcerting squeak emanating from the clutch basket under hard use in the dunes. In terms of the ATV power hierarchy of 1985, the quad racer sat toward the back of the pack. It was on par in potency with the Yamaha Tri-Z, but a step behind the hard-hitting Kawasaki and broadly powered Honda. Most people felt Honda's 249cc 6-speed mill offered the best combination of horsepower and usability, 
with the Kawasaki Strong Top End appealing to three-wheel throttle jockeys. All four were plenty fast enough to be fun, but if horsepower was your main concern, the Quad Racer was not going to blow off your boot gaiters. On the suspension front, the Quad Racer was once again a middle-of-the-pack performer. None of the hot rod ATVs available in 1985 offered the same sort of suspension sophistication found on their motocross cousins, but one definitely did a better job of smoothing out the bumps than the others. For most riders, it was Honda's ATC 250R with its beefy 39mm front forks and Pro-Link rear that did the best job of taking the bite out of the track in 1985. With a class-leading 9.8 inches of travel, front and rear, and well-sorted damping, the Red Rooster lapped the field with its excellent combination of comfort and control. With only 7.9 inches of travel, and no adjustments aside from spring preload available, the front shocks on the Quad Racer were painfully average performers. Harsh at low speed and prone to bump steer, the front end of the Quad Racer transmitted far more of the track to the rider's wrists than most pilots appreciated. Serious leapers showed the limits of their modest performance, and most riders considering racing their quad would have been well advised to consider aftermarket upgrades to the front suspension. In the rear, the full floater showed much better performance with a decent ride that worked well under most circumstances. Its relative lack of travel held it back in comparison to the excellent ProLink in the Honda, but for most applications shy of the track, it was a good performer. The overall ride of the rear shock was much smoother than the front units, and most riders could find an acceptable setting with its limited adjustments. Just as with the front, Big jumps could overwhelm with stock settings, but the suspension was never intended for racing in stock condition. If racing was your plan, the floater's heavy rebound could become an issue as it tended to pack down on repeated hits. For trail riding and playing in the dunes, this was no issue, but any decently long set of whoops was likely to flummox its overzealous stamping. On the detailing front, the quad racer proved very good overall. The understressed motor was reliable and held up well to abuse in stock condition. For those looking for more power, replacing the stock exhaust, rejetting the carb, and opening up the airbox unlocked a significant amount of performance without impacting its reliability. The Quad Racer's new bodywork was handsome, and most riders found its ergonomics spacious and comfortable. The stock thumb throttle was panned by nearly everyone, and several testers commented that its return spring was far too strong, leading to premature thumb fatigue. Even without a battery, the standard halogen headlight worked well, and the Quad Racer was a ton of fun to ride long after the motocross guys headed back to the truck. The stock alloy silencer was super trick and a nod to the machine's performance and tensions. It was slightly louder than the steel units found on the competition, but much lighter and still off-road legal. The triple disc brakes worked extremely well, and several testers commented that they wished that the RMs had come with similarly powerful units. Underbody protection was all but non-existent, with the only coverage being a flimsy cover on the rear rotor. Bent sprockets, busted rotors, and cracked cases were a major concern for anyone planning to ride the quad racer in a rocky environment. Unless you were planning to only ride in the dunes, aftermarket skid plagues were a must. In the final analysis, the quad racer's mild-mannered motor and mediocre suspension were not nearly enough to overshadow its inherent handling advantages. Despite being slower and harsher in the rough than Honda's ATC 250R, the quad racer proved nearly unbeatable on the track. It was easier to ride slow, safer to ride fast, and impressively light despite the added complexity of its four-wheeled layout. Even longtime ATC devotees found its charms difficult to ignore. Within two years of the Quad Racer's debut, the high-performance three-wheeler would be all but a memory, with Kawasaki finally retiring the KXT250 in 1987. Even without government pressure, however, the excellence of Suzuki's inspired design was hard to ignore and the market would certainly have moved toward a four-wheeled future in short order. Bold, innovative, and game-changing, Suzuki's 1985 Quad Racer stands as one of the truly iconic machines of the golden age of high-performance ATVs. So there you have it. That's a look back at the very first Suzuki Quad Racer, a machine that really changed the world of ATV racing and off-road riding going forward. The three-wheelers were kind of coming under a little bit of... Uh, pressure from the federal government anyway, but I think the switch to quads would have happened either way. Uh, once people rode the quad racer, even though that particular machine wasn't the fastest ATV, you know, I think the Honda had a better motor and better suspension, uh, it really just could not compete in terms of stability. And that was really the main problem with the ATVs, the early ATCs. They really had, you know, that issue where if you got them in an off camber or if you came into a corner a little too hot it was really easy to high side the darn thing. And the quad, while it was still possible to flip it, you can flip any ATV, 
it was much easier to control and a lot harder to, to crash it, I think. And uh, once once Suzuki introduced this machine, I think the manufacturers, Kawasaki, Honda, and Yamaha, kind of saw the writing on the wall, and they were all going to switch to quads either way. Um, it really was a great time for ATV enthusiasts like myself. Uh, There's a lot of great machines available here in the 80s, I and mean, this quad racer was certainly a game changer that uh, really, really stands as one of the most important ATVs ever built, in my opinion. Uh, so if you like this sort of thing, make sure you check out my other videos. Like I said, if you could share this on social media, uh, let other people know on Twitter, X, whatever they're calling it these days, I would certainly appreciate it. And until we meet again, this is Tony Blazer from the Motocross Vault. Keep the rubber side down. Peace. <laughs>